Hello, I'm Paul Bradshaw. And I'm Lauren Gray. Welcome to Viral History, your weekly look at all things history. Coming up on this week's show, I sit down with historian, author and broadcaster Mark Morris. We get exclusive access to a Georgian party at Dr Johnson's house. And I come to Journey's End on my epic hike through history along Pilgrim's Way. First up, the news. The discovery of Bronze Age weapons has been hailed as the find of a lifetime. The rare gold decorated bronze spearhead, sword, pin and scabbard fittings were discovered at a dig in Balmachie in Carnoustie, Scotland. Also in Scotland, a Viking boat burial is revealing its secrets. The burial in Sordal Bay most likely dates to the 9th century and provides a rare glimpse into the extent of Viking travel and burial rites. And the island that sparked the idea for the National Trust is now in its care. Grasmere Island in the Lake District attracted the attention of Hardwick Rawnsley when it was put up for sale in 1893. That sale sparked events that led to the formation of the Trust, which protects important sites like Grasmere. Hi, I'm Fen Riddell and this is Viral History. No, he's a medievalist with a killer knack for seeing through medieval propaganda, getting down to the facts of historical sources. He's written on everyone from Edward I to King John, but recently he's been consumed by the Norman Conquest. Yes, 950 years after that seismic event, Viral History sat down with Mark Morris to talk 1066 and all that. Mark Morris, welcome to Viral History. First question, why did the Norman Conquest matter? The Norman Conquest matters because it is the single biggest change that England ever experiences. The fact that William defeated Harold at Hastings on the 14th of October 1066 causes enormous change. Um, the biggest change at the time was that the aristocracy of Anglo-Saxon England was swept away. Thousands and thousands of people who had been in charge of England, the earls, the thanes, and all their um, underlings, Around about 8,000 people are, within a generation, replaced by a class of people who speak a different language, i.e. French, and who have a different set of ideas in their heads. So their Normans do warfare differently. They build castles. Not only do they sit on horseback and do cavalry tactics, they build castles, which were a, a brand new foreign imposition on England. They fill the land with hundreds and hundreds of castles. They rebuild every single major church, every cathedral and every major abbey is ripped down and replaced. So they have different attitudes to warfare, they have different attitudes to architecture, they have different attitudes to human life itself. The Normans abolished slavery, the English had regarded the bottom 10 or 20 percent of the population as slaves, no better than beasts in the field, people with no rights at law at all who could be branded or beaten or even killed by their owners. Um, the Normans do away with that. At the same time, the Normans introduce chivalry, which means they spare their opponents once they have defeated them. They don't, as the Vikings and the Anglo-Saxons have done, kill them when they're on their knees begging for mercy. Um, now, these are big changes um, because these these attitudes, these new attitudes, filter down very quickly to the rest of the English population. And they mean that by the 12th century, when the English start looking at their neighbours in the British Isles, i.e. the Welsh, the Scots and the Irish, they start to see this big difference in the way that each, each of them do warfare, for example, the way each of them treat other human beings. And they decide, as they start to invade these countries, that the people they're invading are barbarians, that they are going into these countries as a civilizing mission. So the Norman conquest affects the way that the English perceive their Celtic neighbors, and it, it underpins, it gives a rationale for the invasions of those Celtic countries for the rest of the Middle Ages and way beyond. In what way was it a righteous conquest for William of Normandy? First of all, in 1066, one of the first things he does um, when he realises that he is going to have to fight Harold for the throne is he appeals to the Pope to get the Pope's blessing. Um, and William, we know since his boyhood, or at least since his teens, has been under the personal tutelage of a very, at the time, very celebrated um, scholar called Lamfranc of Beck. So this, this internationally famous theologian has schooled William 
and affected many of William's beliefs. And you can see in William, I think, the almost um, like a proto-crusading or a, a sort of puritanical Christianity. Um, so he's convinced of the righteousness of his claim. And I think this is crucial to understanding why William embarks upon the conquest and why he thinks it's possible. Because you, you tend in some books to see William represented as just another Norman or continental chancer. You know, he's ju it's just a punt, the Norman conquest, nothing more. He's doing it because England is a rich country. Now, that's true, England is a rich country, and there must be many hundreds of thousands of people in William's army who are doing it because they think they'll make themselves rich. But I think William himself, it's an insanely risky undertaking. If you look at his warfare up to that point, it's been cautious, he's been careful to avoid battle, it's been attritional. To raise an army and a fleet, to commit yourself to the wind, to risk shipwreck and bad weather, to land on foreign soil, to fight an unknown enemy, um, is literally to commend the justice of your cause to the judgment of God. And so William you know, is, is, is that kind of mentality. He thinks he's right, he knows he's right, and he's putting his case before God. And what were the practical consequences of the conquest to the people of England? In the first instance, um, the Norman conquest causes huge loss of human life. I mean, the Battle of Hastings, we don't know how many people were fighting on each side. Some historians would say, you know, more than 10,000 each side, others as few as 5,000. But however big the armies, the body count was huge. We know it was a very bloody battle, not just Harold that got killed, but his brothers and countless hundreds, maybe thousands of other Englishmen, as well as Normans. So that the, the battlefield the next day is strewn with bloodied um, bodies. Thereafter, uh, the Battle of Hastings is just the beginning of the Norman Conquest. It's not that you know uh, William takes over and then the Anglo-Saxons accept him. The first four or five years of William's reign are ones of constant insurgency and rebellion by the English and repression by the Normans, increasingly violent repression. So William is marching into various bits of the country, in the West Country, the Midlands and the North, planting castles and um, putting down um, English rebellions with extreme prejudice. So there are tens of thousands of people being killed in those years of rebellion. The most devastating uh, result of the Norman Conquest happens in Yorkshire, or points north of the River Humber, when at the end of this cycle of rebellions, William decides he's never going to be able to hold northern England by peaceful means or by planting castles and leaving garrisons in them. His, his very barbaric solution, brutal solution, is to simply break up his army into small units and send them around the various towns and villages north of the Humber to destroy the crops and the animals. Incidentally, lots of people get killed in that process. It's known as harrying. And it's a perfectly normal, and as contemporaries would have seen it, legitimate way of waging war. But the scale on which William does it shocks contemporaries because he lays waste to everything north of the Humber, making it incapable of supporting animal life and human life. And so the consequence is lots of people may be killed in the harrying process, but tens of thousands spilling over into a six-figure number, more than 100,000 people perish as a result of the famine that follows. So the consequences of the Norman Conquest for the English people were, in the first instance, terrible. This was a very brutal, very violent conquest. The land is filled with castles. They are now second-class citizens in their own country. Turning to King John, another area of study for you. It's 800 years now since King John's death at Newark Castle. Is his terrible reputation deserved? Uh, yes, I mean, in a nutshell. I thought you were gonna say, is his reputation deserved without qualifying it? And of course, his reputation in recent years has been improved because uh, some scholars in the 20th century looked afresh at the evidence and decided John wasn't as bad as medieval people had claimed. They looked at the products of his um, writing office. They looked at basically administrative documents and said, look how dynamic he is. Look how conscientious he appears to be in doing justice. Look how industrious he is in um, doing the business of kingship. But the problem with that rehabilitation is you have to discard all of the contemporary evidence, the chronicles, 
both lay and ecclesiastical, in unison telling us what a jerk the man was. So that's very easy to discard it when it is so across the board. The other thing is, even judged by his own actions, even if you didn't have that chronicle evidence, John's actions are beyond the pale, even by medieval standards. So if you look, for example, people think of the Middle Ages as a brutal time. It should be, you know, maybe it was compared to the, the modern age, but then we have brutalities in, in the age in which we live. Um, but this is a period, the period in which John lives is a period where, for example, it is not politically acceptable to do away with, to murder your political enemies. It's a period of high chivalry. So if you capture someone, you imprison them, you can keep them in comfortable captivity for years. If they promise to behave, you might eventually ransom them. What you're not allowed to do, what is absolutely taboo, is kill them. And what does John do to his nephew Arthur when he captures him in 1203, uh, 1202? He kills him or makes him disappear the following year in 1203. What does John do when he captures the wife of William de Brios, Matilda de Brios, and her son, her adult son? He starves them to death in one of his castle dungeons. What does John do with Arthur's supporters in 1202? He starves them to death en masse in Corfe Castle. This is not acceptable. This kind of Game of Thrones style behavior was not acceptable in this period of the Middle Ages. Um, and John was condemned by contemporaries for his cruelty and his cowardice. Wow, King John really was a bad egg. A stinker. And by the way, Mark Morris's Twitter feed is always informative and often hilarious. An evening of celebration. An excuse to dress up, meet up, and return to the Georgian era. A time to toast this 18th century man of letters. Johnson's best remembered as being the, the author of the first comprehensive English dictionary, which very much set the tone and standard and format for every English dictionary throughout the world that's been produced since, including the Oxford English Dictionary. Uh, so you might be forgiven for thinking he's quite austere and uh, very cerebral, which he absolutely was, but he was a very sociable character as well. Um, the, you know, the clubs, the taverns, the inns in the 18th century, walking down Fleet Street, um, he would have been instantly recognisable as quite a, quite a unique character, distinct from his, uh, his writings. And um, it's very important to us today, uh, here in Johnson's house, to continue that idea of uh, convivial gatherings. Dr Johnson lived in this house between 1748 and 1759, and it was here, paying a rent of £30, he compiled his famous A Dictionary of the English Language. His place in the English language is so important, and he was so much part of what we would think of as Georgian Britain, that he's just endured, he was larger than life in every sense of the expression, and he just holds a fascination. He I think people feel as though he could just walk through the door today. He's very much a human hero. The Georgian Dining Academy was on hand to ensure all the guests had an entertaining and informative evening before carriages conveyed them back to the 21st century. This is Hayley Considine for Viral History. Wow, it looked like a great night out. It did indeed. So, last week I got within sight of Journey's End on my long distance walk retracing the steps of medieval pilgrims. This week I reach Canterbury and come face to face with Thomas Beckett's lasting legacy in the final part of Pilgrim's Way. I've reached the outskirts of Canterbury, retracing the steps of not only pilgrims, but kings of England. So this is St Dunstan's Church just near Canterbury's West Gate. Tradition records that King Henry II paused here on his penance to Becket's shrine. He put on a hair shirt here and completed his journey barefoot. Thomas Becket, the Archbishop of Canterbury, had feuded with his former friend, King Henry II, over the power of the church. 
And on the 29th of December 1170, Beckett was brutally murdered by four knights inside Canterbury Cathedral. They believed their king, Henry II, had wanted the turbulent Thomas dead. The Hospital of St Thomas the Martyr, Eastbridge, has been welcoming pilgrims for more than 800 years. In 1180, this undercroft space would have been used to house the poorest of pilgrims. These alcoves would have been rammed with poor pilgrims, spending the night on reeds. This entire undercroft would have housed between 60 and 100 pilgrims per night. I draw closer to the unmistakable sight of the cathedral, following in the footsteps of countless thousands of pilgrims since the 12th century. journey's end for me, 78 miles after leaving London Bridge. Days ago I finally made it to the site of the martyrdom of Thomas Beckett here in Canterbury Cathedral. I'm not a person particularly of faith but I have to say it's quite moving being here um, at the spot where he was murdered on the 29th of December 1170 by men working uh, for, the, for the benefit of King Henry II even though he never explicitly ordered them to kill Beckett. My mind returns to the hundreds of thousands of pilgrims that have been to this place over the centuries and the people that still make this pilgrimage to this day to honour this man and this saint. That cathedral is just magnificent. Yes, and such a thrill to be in that space where that shocking event took place. Speaking of shocking events, here's Marguerite. Twenty third of February. I mentioned earlier that it was Samuel Pepys' birthday today in sixteen thirty three. Turns out he used to squeeze his maid's breasts and read seventeenth century porn. to hit that subscribe button, follow Viral History on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram, like this video and um, tune in next week. And remember, what's past is prologue. See you in seven days. I've got to stop. <laughs> <laughs> it is